Bueno, señores, muy buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Once again, we're here in Prospanica, Milwaukee. I have the opportunity to sit with uh, an interview uh, an individual that I have learned to admire from a very long distance from Florida. Mark Madrid. Mark, mucho gusto por estar aquí. Mucho gusto. It's a pleasure to be here. No, I'm, I'm glad uh, we got an opportunity to fit in your schedule. Uh, talk to us, Mark. Yeah, well, first of all, I mean, when I take a look at the theme of this conference, it's rising and thriving. And who doesn't want to do that? Yes. So I, I applaud that. It's a good message for the participants. It's a good message for the corporations. It's a good message for the presenters. It's a good message for the ecosystem. So uh, I'm the CEO of the Latino Business Action Network, and we are a 501c3 nonprofit that collaborates with Stanford University to champion the Stanford Latino Entrepreneurship Initiative. And under that initiative, we do the most robust research in the country on U.S. Latino and Latina business owners. And what makes that the most robust? Well, it's the largest sample size in existence to date in U.S. history. I've actually surveyed Latino and Latina business owners. What's going right? What's going wrong? Why we're not getting access to capital? And so... Big issue. It. Capital big is issue. big issue. Big, big, huge, huge. And also, you know, the research states that although our... Latino and Latina business owners are outpacing the general market 3x on average the last 15 years in terms of startups. Only 2% or 2% to 3% of those businesses are scaled, meaning over a million dollars of annual gross revenues. So what we're doing through the initiative on priority number two, which is education, is recruiting those top 2 to 3 percenters to come and do a scaling program at Stanford called the Stanford Latino Entrepreneurship Initiative Education Scaling Program. It's a mouthful, but it's in a really impactful experience. It's a seven-week experience focused on scaling. So you stay in Stanford for seven weeks? Well, it's not in residence, so what happens okay. is you go, uh, we invite the entrepreneurs to Stanford for a kickoff weekend, which is a Saturday and Sunday, and then the entrepreneurs go back and execute their uh, businesses and their lives, frankly, and, and the program, which is an online curriculum, then they come back seven weeks later to graduate at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Which is awesome. Yes, it's awesome because over the course of three years, we've been able to graduate 432 entrepreneurs from the program, and together, combined, those 432 are responsible for over $1.5 billion of annual gross revenues to the GDP. And, and that's billion with a B. Now, let, let me ask you something. You said uh, entrepreneurship, you said access to capital. That's right. You got the research, how hard it is. So many of us entrepreneurs out there, we always have to bootstrap it. That's right. And bootstrapping it, you get to a million dollars in sales, but not a million dollars in revenue. That's right. And there's a difference. And many never scale up past five employees. You know that, I know that. That's right. So we need to get that information out Into, into the communities to be able to grow this business. Because as you said, we're going to be the future as well of this that's economy. Right. You know, U.S. Latinos are driving the U.S. economy, and so that's why we feel we have a great opportunity here. But you're right, access to capital is a big, big problem. When you see that our segment is the lowest percentage-wise of accessing bank loans, for instance, uh, compared to any other ethnic group. That's a problem when you're trying to cultivate a growth mindset and go beyond friends, family, and savings to grow one's business. And that's why, frankly, a lot of our business uh, owners are what we call non-employer firms. Me, myself, and I. Yeah, so, wife, husband, and kids that actually go to college and then study accounting and then they come do their books and, and so forth and so on. Now, Mark, big question I've had. Sure. I've, I've, I've sat with smart individuals just like yourself. Hey, how you doing, man? Um, how can we change the way we provide funding? Beacon scores, credit scores, to me is a thing of the past. Because you could have strong micro businesses who make around a quarter million dollars, have two or three employees, support a lifestyle, it's a lifestyle business, because they cannot scale. They cannot find you. I mean, I found you because I'm, I'm in the world of that, try, trying to find it, right? Uh, but you go to the bank, and it's tough, especially if you're first or second generation. You got to juggle a lot of things. You didn't know about your credit. High schools don't teach you to balance your checkbook, don't teach you how to balance credit. We know that. It's a, it's a continuous damage on the financial uh, spectrum for Hispanics. So 
when are banks going to change the way they use? Because around the world, there are harvest studies that they lend the money based on the community to individuals, like micro lending. When is that going to happen? When are the banks going to change, stop looking at a credit score and look at everything else? Because, for example, in my beginnings, I had a bad credit score, but I worked and I saved, 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 paid my car cash, saved, 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 bought my equipment cash, saved, saved, saved. So I don't have any debt, but I don't have any credit back then, right? And that story is repeated in every town, in every zip code, in every neighborhood sometimes. Is there a line at the end of the tunnel for the financial institutions to change the way they lend money? Well, I, I, I think that's why our research is so critical because Latino and Latina businesses are not going to go anywhere. We're just going to get stronger. We're just going to get bigger. We're just going to get more institutionalized. Uh, and, and look at Latina-owned businesses, uh, which are almost 50% now more. of the Latino uh, uh, entrepreneurial <laughs> ecosystem. I mean, I can tell you 85% of my clients are women. That's right. That's right. So I say Latinas are not only running households, but our American economy. But I think it's a two-way street. I, I think the banking and financial institutions need to further understand what our ecosystem Culture. is all about, right? Mm -hmm. And on the flip side, we need to work on being more prepared overall in terms of our presentation. I have uh, one of my dear friends who's also a graduate of our alums who, who was featured last year at the Prismatic in Houston conference, Maria Rios, the queen of trash. She always says, know your banker before you need the money. So, you know, I think our research is helping with policy in terms of moving policy and showing the banks you uh, for whatever reason are not lending to our community a thriving community of business owners that wants to expand most of them I can't imagine anybody who doesn't want to earn over a million dollars of annual gross revenue. I understand. Right? So we got to get there So I think more preparation on our entrepreneurial side and then a further understanding through policy and research on the banking side And I think over time we can move the needle for there to be maybe a, an adjustment, perhaps, an underwriting criteria that will be more favorable to our Latino and Latino business owners. An alternative, right? In schools, in the state of Florida, you you have the FCAT, for example. I think that just went away. But however, I want to use that example because if you were in third grade, you had to get a three, four, and a five to get a fourth grade, right? Or you could build a portfolio of reading work, math work that will be evaluated at the same time. And if that got you over the hump, great. That alternative should be there. Another one I want to talk to you, Mark, and, and get your feedback on. I've talked to Congressman, uh, Congressman Soto from Florida. I used to talk to Congressman Alan Grayson from Florida about it. He's, he's no longer in office. I spoke to Marco Rubio on it. I spoke to Governor Scott from Florida that's going um, he right now is trying to become a senator of Florida. When they're going to pass legislation and policy to allow entrepreneurs in general, in general, mm -hmm. to be, be able to borrow against a portion of the 401k, because as a financial advisor or an individual that owned a financial services practice for over 15 years until, you know, we sold it uh, for a profit, um, we always saw individuals that had an idea uh, and I'm gonna put you the, the right example of when this came about so NASA closed in in Florida you had a boatload of engineers and then Tesla and Elon Musk everybody was coming in SpaceX and they were able to provide services to SpaceX but all they had was a million to five hundred thousand seven hundred thousand in the four one case that's it and withdrawing that money takes a 10% penalty on top of the taxes that you have to pay at the end of the year. So my concept to these guys was allow them to pay the taxes, but don't charge them a penalty if they're going to use the money as collateral for a loan to open up a business and hire people. Well, we definitely there's room for innovation. I see some of our entrepreneurs, even the ones who are scaled, that have struck out for uh, the banking institutions for debt financing for whatever. Really? Reason. Yes. For in, but so it doesn't matter how big you are. Sometimes. Sometimes it, it doesn't, you know, and and so they've resorted to crowdfunding measures like Kickstarter, GoFundMe, and 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 they've been able to secure financing that way. Some of them have looked into equity crowdfunding, for instance. So it's good for our community to be disruptive, to continue to have the conversations, and to also uh, look at new ideas that are out there. Um, we're trying to move the needle as well when it comes to venture capital, angels, family office financing, as, and, and to make sure that people stay accountable. They may say that they're lending, 
to our Latino and Latina business owners or founders of color, for instance, but we need to hold their feet to the fire because if they say they uh, acquired a $100 million fund and their focus is on lending to these communities, well, we need to make sure that they stay accountable. And if they aren't, tell us why. So uh, I, I like your ideas. I think it's important. I think <laughs> the bottom line and what you're trying to purport here at this conference is to rise up, to have a voice. Uh, and, impacto, and to, de, de impacto. Impacto, that's why uh, I just, I feel that spirit and energy around here with the young professionals, with the professionals, with the executives, with the decision makers that are here. And so uh, I hope that permeates into uh, small business financing as well. Well, now, briefly, where are you from? I'm from the Texas Panhandle. I, I come from a place where the cattle outnumber the people. In fact, I have my boots on like I do oh, every you day. Oh, you do have boots on. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Wish I could show the audience here, but yeah. Um, yeah. nice boots, by the way. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> my parents met on the cotton fields, um, and I was hoeing cotton as soon as they could get me out there at 10 years old, because uh, that's where the jobs were. Um, it wasn't a destination. It wasn't tropical Florida. It was uh, the uh, very uh, desolate parts of the Texas Panhandle and South Plains. And then my father um, decided, you know, he started drawing blueprints on napkins and started picking up trades, just like my grandma taught him. And he became a welder and opened his own welding business. So we moved where the money was, and um, his job was to uh, become one of the most recognized welders, helping uh, with the feedlots, which are where the cattle are held. And that's where we were. Uh, uh, that's where I grew up all my life. Uh, my dad said, if it doesn't smell like blank manure it doesn't smell like money well i can tell you that <laughs> that my first speaking of manure my first job in apopka florida was at a horse table and uh i lasted a full week it, not because i couldn't have the job but even though i was born in new york city i went i went back to ecuador so I came back, I didn't know any English, but I had my papers, right, I, if you will. Uh, so I went and I applied and he hired me because the guy needed to help. And at the time, the pay was $6.10 an hour. He went there to pay me three. Yeah. So after a full week of work, I said, you know what, thank you very much for the experience. Keep your money. I know what I got to do next. And I went back to school. I went to school. And I was like, I, I'm not going to hustle it out, you know. But no, I got tangled up in the ropes of the pony. And he dragged me all over manure. And on my way home, because I didn't have a car, so I had to walk home. Like flies were pretty much chasing me. Horse flies. Those, those are painful when they're yeah, they, yeah, they are. <laughs> you know about it. Oh well. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, we all have that. We have a core of humility, a core of hard work, and uh, those were my circumstances. I didn't grow up in an academic household by any means. I just knew that the way I was going to get out of the small town because the small town wasn't for me. I wanted the big lights, I wanted the big city, was education. And so I just hustled my way uh, to becoming the first valedictorian, and uh, Latino valedictorian in the history of the, of the high school. And um, went on to college, uh, University of Texas. You my work, first job was on Wall Street. You were you behind on. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I did. It was about the hustle game. And it's tough, you know, when you don't have mentorship. And that's why you all... Uh, I, I, I understand it. When you don't have mentorship, it's tough. Yeah. You make financial decisions that at times don't work in your favor. That's right. And that's why I'm glad I hear mentorship at this conference consistently, whether you're in the entrepreneurship track or development track. It is very, very significant to be able to surround yourself by people that are smarter than you at your, at your current stage of life and to be able to count on those for executive and professional decisions as well as personal decisions. And so... I myself, I did, you know, I had a lot of faith that helped me through and, and started my career on Wall Street, uh, first job outside of college. And, um, and, and then I was one step away from being the president of a bank, which is my ultimate dream. And then the financial crisis of 2007, 2008, I actually had to shut down that bank and turn the key to the landlord and offer severance packages. And, but that's when I really had a breakthrough in my thought to devote myself to the Latino and Latina business community. And, and launched my career at the Hispanic Chamber in Houston, then on in Austin, and then here wow. at this national position with uh, the Latino Business Action Network. So my passion right now is, is to, uh, along with so many others that are in this work, is to lift the Latino and Latina business community because we are driving the American economy. And this is an American economic imperative that all Americans should be proud of, not just our community. So that is our, my life's work, and I know it is many others as well. So 
together we're going to make an impact that is going to um, move the needle for our children and our grandchildren. So I'm very honored to be doing well, this Well, entrepreneurs, work. as you heard, together we're going to create financial impact for the future of our community. Uh, thank you, whoever turned that phone off. It was driving me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> so as you guys can see, we're live, we're right. engaging, we're moving right. through, ain't no phone gonna hold us back. <laughs> Mike, thank you very much. No, thank you for this opportunity and I'm excited as well that, that you're an entrepreneur and that you understand this game better than, than anybody else because you're in it. And so thank you for serving on this board. Yeah, and, I, and I'm in it to win it. Hey, there is nothing wrong with winning. I always say I love to compete and I love to win, but I play by the rules. There you go. Thanks guys. Okay, here we go.